amazing things here on Ops Experts Club. So welcome to Ops Experts Club. Awesome to see everybody this morning. Savannah, your backlight looks so just like peaceful. I'm sure that the mother of two has just been peaceful this morning. How, how's how good day so far? Are we doing okay? Are we holding on all right? Toddler is in child care again. So, um, so, you know, that adds a certain level of peace. And then I got little one just staring at her mobile right next to me, listening to Mozart. So yes, Look very, very Look at you. So cultured. Amelia is such a cultured child. That's amazing. So cultured. To be fair, Thea listened to a lot of classical when she was tiny too. It, 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 now she likes, you know, Moana and stuff. <laughs> Moana is, it's a good upgrade. I love it. All righty. So Let's move into our stuff for today. So, hey, just to catch everybody up, and as we talk through Ops Experts Club, I know there's some things that are still new. So you're going to hear me kind of just reiterate things over and over, make sure that like everything's sinking in well and that we've got things dialed in. Um, I wanted to go over the Ops Solution progression and make sure that we're all good on understanding why we're going over what we're going over. So we've covered people. That was kind of the first week. Yes, thank you for dropping the Slido, Savannah, the dream. Um, if you have any questions about anything we're talking about today, feel free to use the Slido uh, uh, link in the uh, chat. But um, we can also just chime in here. It's so mellow. So people is what we've been talking about thus far. We covered that in month one. And maybe if you haven't been in the membership area for a while, here under people, um, that first month we gave you the gap analyzer tool. We worked through how that works on how you just take inventory of your folks, how your people are doing work, what they're doing. We moved into org chart and job descriptions, evaluations, um, into delegate and elevate. Kimberly was the star of that show, we talked about 555 and more. Um, and then we worked into team evaluations and how you're evaluating team. That was the first month. Second month, we moved into processes and that's all following our Ops solution progression, right? We're moving through uh, the first gear of people into processes. And so we worked into processes, gave you some funnel templates as your free tool for the month, talked about the four key areas of developing a business. And then we jumped into it. Taryn really did awesome with landing pages, funnels, and courses. We worked into uh, best practices and tools, um, customer support and the power of a ticket-based system. And then automations and integrations where we left off last week as we continue around the circle of Obsolution progression. We're going to move today into some planning and kind of merge into a, a people 2.0. So just if you can frame up in your brain, there's intentionality around everything that we're doing here. Um, and I think it's important for us to just understand the process and where we're going. Daryl, man, so nice to have you. So nice to have you join us. You Thank know? you, Taryn, for letting me in the meeting. Um, yeah, anytime. <laughs> I got the keys. It's just, it's just nice. It's just nice to have you here. You know what I mean? Like, anyway. I'm usually late to Daryl every week, so it feels so good when Daryl's late to me. Like, that just feels right. Anyway, long story short, um, we're going to work through our planning and People 2.0 this week. Um, and more than anything, as we talk about some of these things today, um, the key that I want everybody to realize is that I talked about a little about my lives as we I was prepping people for ops experts today on their social posts. But I think in business, a lot of times we can just feel like it's just all coming at us, right? Like wave after wave after wave after wave, you know, of demands from our customers or our clients, um, demands maybe from people above us, um, as if there's people in the org that are higher than us or people below us, right? Asking us questions. And there's and not to mention the deliverables that come out of all that, right? Any meetings that you're in the middle of, you've got all these to-dos and it's so easy just to feel inundated and feel like, man, I'm just getting overrun and not realize no, no, we have the ability to create channels. You know I mean, to create channels for where the water's going to flow, right? You can't control a lot of time how the water's hitting you, how the waves are pounding at you, but, but you can't control the ways that you direct the water. I think sometimes you talk to people in business, at least for me, and it's like they're, it's like they've been taken hostage. They've been taken hostage by their business. Like it's not, they're not running their business. Their business is running them, you know, and they're exhausted and they're overplayed. And a lot of times when you start feeling those ways, it makes you more irritable. So then you're turning into somebody that you don't even like being because you're short with people or you're frustrated because you haven't created good margin or you don't have good workflows. So what we're going to talk about today is leading your people from a plan, like leading your business with intentionality creating channels of how you're leading people, how you're leading from the front and giving good direction. Because guys, if, if we as the operations-based people in our businesses aren't leading with intention, aren't leading from a plan, all we can expect is chaos from anybody downstream from us, right? Like, like 
as goes the captain, so goes the ship, you know? And so if, if we don't come into it saying, hey, we're going to lead with intentionality, we're going to operate from a plan. This is how we communicate. This is how we show up. This is what we're going after. Um, it's just going to lead to chaos throughout the team. So Taryn, do you have any thoughts about chaos on teams? Like, is there any good, just like wisdom drop that you just want to just like mic drop, like bumper sticker wisdom from Taryn Turner on chaos on a team? Mm. Well, I don't know about um, mic drop wisdom, but I like the image of the boats. You, you like you like boating images, pirates, of course. Yes, pirates are the best. And for those of you who don't know, Pirate Friday is a thing at Collab Team. We all talk in pirate accent. It's an amazing thing. Anyway, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we'll find ourselves being inserted into a company where the entrepreneur is on his own ship and everybody else is on their own ship just trying to catch up and follow him. Yes. So it's nice that to first get them in the same boat and then start start working together towards uh, the same goals. Yeah, I love that. I think that um, what we found with consistent metrics or consistent framework is accountability, right? One of the biggest things that we can encourage you as we talk about some different tools today, as we take a deep dive into it this month, like this month, we're going into people 2.0. We're going to incorporate planning in that. Um, what we find is really important is accountability. You know I mean, like it's so easy to show up in meetings. It's so, so easy to show up in the day to day and just talk about things. And it's like, did that go anywhere? Are they following up on that? Is there any kind of deliverable where there's that's being tracked? And then are we holding people accountable to that? Or are we going to show up every week and kind of push the peas around the plate? You know what I'm saying? Like as a kid, maybe you grew up, I didn't love peas when I grew, was growing up, you know, so I'd, I'd watch my little kids growing up, like pushing the vegetables kind of around the plate, you know, and like tucking it under different, you know, things that they don't want to eat. Like, we don't want to push it around the plate. We don't want to show up always talking about the same things. We don't always want to show up talking about the same pain points. The best way to do that is establishing accountability and deliverables and also accountability and metrics. Like the more that you can turn an expectation into a number and then hold people accountable to that number it's going to, it's going to show up so much better for you, you know, and we're going to give some examples of how to establish KPIs, you know, keep uh, key performance index. Um, we're going to talk about um, establishing clear metrics and expectations for your people. But I think that more and more, if we can be thinking about our businesses, if I can give you one piece of advice as a snapshot of going into this next session, talking about people 2.0 is how can you create clear accountability on deliverables that have been assigned and clear accountability means a checkpoint, right? You've given it to them somewhere. They have to bring it back to you somewhere. Like same way every time established. And then clear metrics, clear KPIs, um, a scorecard, if you will. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in, in the weeks to come where you can just track your numbers. Hey, what does this line item in my business mean to me? What's the value I want to put on it? And are we meeting that value consistently week over week, month over month um, to get us through the end of the year? Because I think that's that's really the key is you want to start your year with this plan for the year, right? Whether you do an annual planning session, if you haven't done an annual planning session, shameless plug, if you go to winning2022.com, um, that collab team does annual planning for people. So if you haven't done your annual plan, like establish your annual planning, right? And then from your annual plan set up, hey, are we meeting that on a quarterly basis? Um, usually a quarterly check in some sort of quarterly planning session, quarterly rocks. And then how are we looking at that in the week to week? Otherwise we can come up with these big things, these big goals for the year that we don't establish clear check-ins on. And then we're so surprised why we didn't hit the metrics or what happens a lot of times. And you'll see this in a lot of businesses. We only talk about the things we nailed at the end of the year. We're like, we killed it on this. We did so great on this. But oftentimes if you were to hold those side by side with what we talked about at the beginning of the year, we're not even chasing the same thing anymore. It's totally evolved into something different. And that's fine. There's evolution that can come in business. But I would say um, create your, your annual plan with some intention on where you want to end up and then hold some metrics. Uh, Daryl and I, uh, I trained with Daryl. Daryl's got um, a whole amazing thing with his uh, martial arts academy. And he does, has several businesses tucked into that. And he does a great job of the things he does. That's all the compliments you're going to get out of me today, Daryl. But um, like does great at what he does. But Daryl and I even set up um, a plan for our, for my year physically, like, Hey, where do I want to be at by the end of quarter one? And how are we going to set milestones on how I'm going to get there? And so Daryl's got me on workout routine. We're taking measurements. That's how we talk about the metrics, right? We've got very, very clear things that if I want to be someplace by 
the end of quarter one, I need to set something, you know, to get me there. And so anyway, those are the things we're going to talk about today and take a deep dive into any, any initial questions before we start, I'm going to take you on a little bit of field trip, but does anybody have any thoughts on that or things they want to throw in Savannah? You're brilliant. Kimberly, Daryl, you guys both have great um, impact. Experts club isn't about you guys looking to us as experts. We're all experts. We're all working together. So um, do you guys have any follow-up thought on any of that as we pull into a field trip? I don't know if I want to release Daryl after all that compliment. Yeah, I, this is a lesson I kind of learned the hard way. Um, coming in, we, you know, we had a lot of things we needed to establish. And so it was like kind of like a lot of plates sitting at, at the same time. And, um, you know, I, I'm thinking like I'm creating structure over here and I'm creating structure over here, but I didn't have the margin in place, like for myself. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was feeling it kind of like wearing a turtleneck. If you're not a turtleneck person, it was kind of like that, you know? Yes. And, um, and then, so I had to, like, I really had to just have this come to Jesus meeting, like step back and, and be like, okay, how do I, how do I fix this? Like, how do I even have time to think about how to fix this? And the, the delegate and elevate was really the knight in shining armor for me. Um, it just, it was a matter of raising up um, the right people to kind of help bear some of the burden. And then we could, we could move forward together and we can plan together. And like, I don't have to, my strengths don't have to cover everything. Like there are other people who have incredible yep. gifts who can step in and do like infinitely better than me. And like these, you know, spots that I'm plugging up just because there's nobody in that seat. And so, um, yeah, like that was, a, that was a huge learning curve for me. And I would, this is one of those things. It's like, I would have loved to be here yeah. in September <laughs> and like being able to learn all that, um, just from a, a session like this, instead of having to learn the hard way. Um, so I, I so honor you guys for doing this today and like just bringing up this, this huge, um, like lifesaver, like this can save so much time and, and energy in the long run, having this right from the get-go. Yeah, I have a, Kimberly, I just want to give you some kudos, so just some praise in front of all of these people, um, is I've really seen you level up so amazingly already this year. We're only two months in, and I feel like just your growth and being able to delegate and elevate, going through that tool wasn't just an exercise for you. I've seen, I've watched you hand pieces off of the business and not try and do it all. You know, I, I feel like for, for me, I had to come to a place like that with tech, with Taryn, like I felt like I could continue trying to do all these different things, but the real truth is there are people on my team that are better than me at things, you know, and Taryn, like his mind is just so good around tech and automations and how to like master architecture and how are we thinking about how this is going to hit us over here. And I feel like I'm okay as a stopgap. Like if, if something's burning down, I can jump in the middle of it and I can get you where we need to go. But otherwise I need to defer to people that are better than me on my team that are good at that. You know, Savannah, same thing. Like Savannah has gone so far, so much further than me. Like all these components of CoLab team started with me at some origin point, but Savannah has taken like the whole customer experience end of thing so much further than I ever could possibly think of. Like looking through your project plan this morning on Asana, uh, Savannah for how you're helping Trudy build out their Zendesk. I just thought this, she is just good at this stuff. This is what she's... She's just so great. And not only like thinking through the structure of it, but even just the, the people part of it, Savannah is just so good with people and also firm, right? Because sometimes I can just want to be nice all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like that can be my go-to, but Savannah does a really good balance of nice, but firm. Like, like yes, that's what we want to give people, but we're only going to give them so much. And this is the framework they can work within. And like, don't, don't let them run the field. And that's probably mom of a toddler, right? Like, don't, you can't just let them run them up. We took away dinos yesterday from Thea. We took away Lincoln logs yesterday from Thea because she, because she had a meltdown. Like, I think that you're a good, you're a good mom, but it shows up in business. And I think all those things, Daryl and I have those kind of conversations all the time about, bro, you're so much more valuable than that task. Who can we hand that to? Because man, the more we can elevate Daryl's value, the more we're going to see return on it throughout the business. And so I just think all those different things, how can we be thinking with intention on how we're setting up the plan, who we're committing certain metrics to, how we're doing certain measurements. I think it's so good. I think yeah. like, um, you know, to speak a little bit more to Kimberly and what it is that you were saying, I learned yesterday, ironically enough, yesterday that I'm no longer um, self-employed. 
you know, and I think that's the big difference because being self-employed means I can run everything on my own. Mm -hmm. Until yesterday, I realized there's a difference between self-employed, you know, being a hustler and making that money Mm -hmm. and being a businessman and actually having to generate profits, um, track what's going on, have people like Aaron said, that are better than me at these things and then allowing them the space to actually do something that I can't do. I mean, I had a, what is it? The L L10. Yeah. L10 kicked off this week for Daryl. That was pretty yeah, awesome. That was Kimberly. No, it was a horrible <laughs> meeting. <laughs> there were so many holes that came out of that meeting and Ben hurt my feelings, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I've had L10s like that. And Aaron was there. (laughs) That's what L10s are for. They're to hurt your feelings and kick your butt and get you going. (laughs) Identify the gaps so you can fill them. Just like you do on the net. Well, I think like the thing is, Aaron said it before. We've had um, talks about this as he's been trying to get me to do this a year ago. Um, You're spinning plates. And as long as you're spinning plates, you're not going to be able to think of the things that matter because you're constantly trying to grab and continue that spinning piece of it. That's my analogy, not Aaron's. Anyway, um, (laughs) but (laughs) sitting down with Ben and Ben knows absolutely nothing about martial arts, nothing about fitness um, as an organization. And so he just started asking me questions anyone walking off the street would ask. And I hated him for it, you know, because I'm like, there were so many holes, like so many and I couldn't blame every single one of the holes on Aaron, but I tried. I really did. <laughs> so I'm having a blast, you know, um, shout out to my boy, because I finally saw what he was trying to tell me for the last year. Um, and now I'm ready to start working. And it came at a great time because I'm starting another business mm-hmm. and I'm applying all these principles in the forefront before I even open the doors. Yeah. So I'm kind of pumped about that. Save you so much work in the long run. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so what much. Taren, Taren said it best a couple of a couple of sessions ago, and that is like spending a couple of hours now is going to save you so much time downstream. But it's so hard to create those couple of hours when you feel like you're running so hard. And sometimes we can mistake activity for progress. I mean, like sometimes, like we're so busy, we're so busy, we're so busy. But but the energy's frenetic. You're frantically trying to get through your stuff without intentionality and going towards like, is this on mission? Are we on mission for what we set out to do? Because, you know, like to continue the analogy of a ship, the reason why you set up your quarterly check-ins is like, if you're off just a few degrees, man, it's not noticed. You can correct that the first quarter, but if you're off just a few degrees and you end up by the end of the year, you can end up way off path of where you thought you were going to be by just a few degrees off each day and chasing after frenetic energy and thinking that you're busy, man, I'm so busy. I'm always so busy. I've got so much activity, but is it activity or is it progress? You know, because if it's not progress, then you're going to end up two, three, four years into your business and wonder why am I relatively the same size? Like, why have we not really moved very far? Why have we really not done very much? And it's because you're not setting to the plan. You're not setting to the course. Every every shipmaster has a map. Taryn Turner. Every Captain Jack Sparrow has a map that they're operating from. You know what I'm saying? So I think you got to think about where you're going and how you're getting there. Taryn, you unmuted. Did you have some brilliance to share with us, or are you just like nodding and, and agreeing? No, sir. I think I've been unmuted the whole time. But thanks oh, it's for because I, I love when you unmute though, and, and when you're unmuted all the time, it makes me even happier. Okay, so I'm going to share a tool, guys. As we take you on field trips, you know, because sometimes I can watch your guys' eyes just get huge, like you're like, uh, like Terrence. Terrence took us through like three or four tools um, a couple of sessions ago on automations, and I just watch people's eyes just be like, oh, I don't use those tools. Should I be using those tools? Like and just like stress. Like when we show you things, it's not for the sake of inspiring stress. It's for the sake of opening your mind to think about. Have I been thinking about that wrong? Or could I be thinking about that different? Or inviting you into the conversation as we get further into this call today to bring back some of the experiences you've had of, hey, I might not use that exact thing, but I've tried this because I feel like the tools that we bring, we're not saying are the best of the best. Any, There's no other tool out there as good as this tool. It's just the tools that our experience has led us to. And we feel like they're pretty excellent. So we're going to suggest them to you, but there are great tools out there. So as we suggest some things today, I'm going to take you on a field trip right now into a tool. Just know this. I'm going to give you all these tools for free. First off, this is the this is the free tools for this month. Um, but these don't have to be your tools. Sometimes it's just like it's inspiration, right? It's um, 
I love meeting with people like you were saying, Daryl, when somebody walks in the room that doesn't have any idea what I do and starts asking me questions, it opens my mind up to think a different way. Cause sometimes you get lost in the forest for the trees. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're just, you're just punching at your stuff and it's good for somebody to come in and ask you questions and lob a, a you know, a curveball into your court. And you're like, wait a minute, that's a, because sometimes things just happen generationally. I've been doing them so long. I just assume this is how I should always be doing them. And it's really good to spot check. It's really good to say, hey, is this still a good thing for me to be doing? Or should I be disengaging and trying something new? So with no further ado, we're going to look at some things. So I'm going to show you what we use as far as a tool when it comes to our annual planning. Um, just to set a, a marker, right? We're talking about like starting from the beginning and working our way forward. So I thought it'd be good for you guys just to see kind of what we do and how we move things forward. So this is our annual planning agenda. I always try and keep it really simple. Um, you know, I think annual planning sessions can really intimidate uh, main leaders or even worse sometimes, like they can get in there and feel like they have to just preach the whole time. I mean, like they, a lot of times visionaries from the top are really good at selling. So then they get into an annual planning session and they feel like they have to sell something to their people instead of no, 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 no. Like, let's take all that hot air out of the room. Like uh, this happened. It was so great. I think one of the best pictures I had of this was doing annual planning this year with John Acuff and his team is he's, he gave me the best compliment. And, you know, a lot of the visionaries at the top, they're not gushers. So they're not going to just like gush on you after the session or whatever. But like he said it in front of this group of people that I really respect. And he said, I had this revelation after I did my annual planning session with Aaron. And that was, um, I told Jenny, my wife, right? So when they start talking to their wife about you, you know, you like you're, you, you've made a good impact, right? So he said, I was telling Jenny, I had this realization after annual planning of, oh, this is what these are supposed to be like. And I realized that I had no business leading annual planning sessions for my company any more than showing up and offering to cut those ladies hair. You know I mean, like, like, as you know, he's got this team of ladies and he just said, you know, I, I realized this isn't my skill set. I shouldn't be showing up expecting this to be my skill set any more than I would offer to cut their hair in the meeting. Like it's like it's that apples and oranges. Like, and so it was cool because I feel like by somebody showing up and helping facilitate your annual planning, you you as the leader don't have to feel like you're the one that has to show up with all the answers. You don't have to lead the whole thing. You don't have to like preach from the front and give everybody this sales pitch, convincing them that your ideas are great. It's about no, no, no. Let's just set out what are the goals. And so, and, and then talk from there and suss out the details. So for me, usually um, I'll start with ethos and I'll ask the team to review our company ethos and answer the question below, what resonates most with you as you review the, the ethos? Um, the ethos for us is just um, a visual of how at the CoLab team we do things. So for us, it's um, our mission and vision are at the top. So a vision is where we're going and the mission is the vehicle that drives us there. You know, so the mission for us is wowed clients in every vertical. Like Colab team does a little bit of everything, right? And we talk about this all the time. You know, I've got real estate gurus and I've got marketing gurus and I've got Christian entrepreneur gurus and I've got breweries and I've got coffee shops and I've got um, Sensei Daryl and his martial arts. You know, I've got, I've got all these diverse things, but what we found is that um, operations is operations is operations in, in almost nearly every vertical. It's very, very good crossover across the board. So for us, we want wild clients in every vertical. The way that we're gonna get there is creating valuable solutions that exceed client expectations. I never want somebody to show up and say, yeah, it was okay. What the co-op does is it, it, it's okay. I'd rather people not pay me. I'd rather just give people the money back. If they feel like it's only okay, then, then we've missed it. You know, My mission is to get people to be wowed. The way they're wowed is by exceeding their expectations. And then the way that we do that is we take people through a filter, like these are the questions that we ask ourselves as we're creating solutions for folks, which is, does it honor the client and our commitment? Does it provide value to the client and the collab team? And is this something we can all be proud of? And the, the filter is just something to be asking ourselves as we're doing projects, as we're working with people, as we're leading teams, does it honor, does it honor them? Does it honor our commitment, what we said we're going to do? Does it provide value not only to them, but to us? Because there are sometimes where it's not a win-win. And if all we're doing is giving them value, but it really is gouging us, we need to have a, an honest conversation about, is this a good relationship for us to stay in? And then is this something we can all be proud of? And if we can't be proud of it, I'd rather us stop doing it. You know, and then obviously from there, our guiding values is what's our internal compass. Our external promises is the result. And um, you, know, you, re you can read through those. I, I um, I'm going to give this to you anyway, so you can read through them, but I will ask my team at the beginning. It's, it's kind of a feel good exercise, right? It's kind of warm up the room. Hey, review the ethos and come back and tell us what, what resonates most with you. Cause then it's like, 
that's also a document that people may not always be looking at. So I try and go over the ethos um, on annual planning, but also in our quarterly evals too. Hey, take a look at the ethos. Tell me what's resonating with you for the sake of us all being really clear on this mission statement, this guiding document. So from there, um, I'll give them some reflection questions and I'll try and keep people out of tech as much as possible. COVID's made that really tough because it make, has made almost everything virtual, but you don't want your people distracted with their phones, dis distracted with answering emails, distracted with a bunch of technology. So I'll ask them to actually write them out, put it on a physical piece of paper. And then I asked my team this year, hey, take a picture and send it over to me because I want to see it, but I don't want us all just to be on our computers the whole time. So my, the questions I want them to be thinking through is what are we doing well? What could we be doing better? And then what should be fixed or cut? And this one actually is, is one of the most critical questions, I think, is because sometimes you can like limp something along for so long that we really should have just decided a while ago, that's dead weight. We should have just cut that out. It maybe it maybe it served us well. Um, maybe it's it served us well when we did it. Maybe it served us well when we started, but does it still serve us well? Should it still be part of our product suite? Should it still be part of the services that we're offering? Or was that a generational thing that should be paired out? Paired out? I know, Kimberly, we had some pretty interesting conversations this last L10 on Steven's team of, hey, should we still be doing that? Should we still be offering that? That actually is confusing the value ladder now because we, we don't really want to encourage people that direction anymore. So let, let's try and like taper that off and push people this new direction. So I think it's always good to be asking not only you as the leader, but your people, what do you guys see on the horizon that we should think about fixing or cutting? Um, and then we move into the vision traction. I think there's, you know, one good example that I recently saw was uh, one of our clients. They they had this pretty big price point product, about twenty thousand dollars. Make most of their money on that product, and as they came to the new year, they decided to cut it, even though the product had the most sales, even though it was their biggest money maker, because they realized it was a one year program that wasn't serving their clients. So as a team, they decided they wanted to serve their clients better, got rid of this twenty to $20,000 one-year program, and are now transitioning into quicker programs that serve their clients better, even if they might be at smaller price points. So, I mean, you don't always look at the money value. Yeah, that's good. That's a good example, Taryn. And I think probably that probably goes back to a lot of your ethos too, like why you do what you do. Are you in business to make money? Or are you in business to serve people? Or is there a combination? Because I mean, some people, maybe it's just info products and all you're giving people is just, you're just selling products. You know what I mean? So maybe you're you're not always thinking through a long-term relationship like that, but it's great, Taryn, like what you said, this, these are people that are wanting to grow people's engagement. And so you need to ask yourself, is this, is this serving them? And in the end, will it even serve us? Because I can only grow them up the value ladder if they're getting traction with me. And if they're not, they're going to end up having probably a bad taste in their mouth and exiting. And that's not going to be the longest ROI, return on investment, I can see from customer base. So that's good. Sometimes it can answer both. I love that. So one of the tools we're going to go over today is the Vision Traction Organizer. So this is this is a tool. This is one of those ones where I'm like, hey, I'm going to show you something. Don't let it blow your brain. This is just to give you some ideas. Um, but I do think it does it well. VTO is comes out of EOS, the system, entrepreneur operating system. We've talked about this a lot. Gino Wickman's book, Traction, it's what we do. The L10 meetings comes out of EOS. Um, 555 comes out of EOS. Delegate and Elevate comes out of EOS. VTO is just another tool that's in the toolbox of EOS. So, and just so you guys know, you guys can go and find, if you, if you Google search EOS toolbox, you can find all those tools free. They're going to give you guys all those tools for free. You know, what EOS does is how to use those tools. That's where they make their money. They're, they're looking to teach you how to do that. And for the CoLab team, so EOS does a whole implementer phase where they implement that into your business, where the CoLab team fits into that is we're integrators. Like we come and take these tools that they've taught you and integrate that in the day-to-day -day business. How does EOS play out throughout your business? So that's the dichotomy of those things. So I'm going to slide down and we're going to go through VTO real quick. So the vision traction organizer, what I love about it most is that it's very, very simple. Um, there, there's nothing like earth shaking that they're talking through here, but it puts it all on a one sheet to keep you very, very clear on the direction that you're going. So the VTO is um, what are your core values? If you haven't established your core values yet, this is a great spot to start. Like what are the five things that, and maybe it's more than five, you know, I think um, AYR, I think has seven, you know, advance your reach Pete, Pete's, uh, business, Pete Vargas, uh, has seven different, different people have different things. And if you've noticed on our ethos, I don't necessarily abide by only like core values for us. That's come out in guiding values and service promises. 
Um, but essentially it's what are we think is what are we saying is important? What's the most important of things to us as a business? Because you're creating a filter from that. It helps you make your decisions. And then from core values, what's your core focus? Like this is our passion and this is therefore our niche. Because in business, that's what it's all about, right? Like you're you're trying to niche down on what are the most important things for you? Like, how does that work? Um, and then it's gonna be able to give you some of this stuff down below, but you really have to get clear on what am I in this business for and what is our unique? Like what, what's our niche? Who are we trying to hit? Um, what's our 10 year target? Like, where do I wanna be in 10 years? Sometimes I don't think about that, you know, like, okay, if I stay on this trajectory, where will it take me in 10 years or challenge that? Do I wanna be someplace greater? And then it helps you recalibrate on everything that's gonna lead you up to that place. Um, from there, um, who's our target market? Um, an example would be uh, for something like this is obviously uh, in, in clothing, and, and I'm going to throw myself under the bus a little bit here. Um, in like um, Abercrombie is a much different target market than um, Coldwater Creek. You know what I mean? Like they're very, very different when it comes to who their target market is, who is their list. Abercrombie, you see it like all very attractive, young, thin people. Um, you know, a lot of times men with no shirts on wearing the denim, like that's their whole jam, you know, black and white photos, that, that's the niche they're creating for themselves. Cold Water Creek, uh, women over 55, you know, and so a lot of times that the models aren't always slender, aren't always younger, like, like they're, they're catering to um, grandmothers, young, young grandmothers and Anna. Uh, Terrence laughing because when I worked in Wyoming while I lived in Star Valley, um, I worked at Coldwater Creek for a season of time. Um, and uh, there are plenty of funny pot shot stories that people can take at me for that. We'll get into it a different time. But yes, I did try on women's jeans at one point and um, I have a great story about it. So anyway, long story short, um, but those two have a very different target market. You know, and when it comes to their ads and how they're running ads and how they're trying to advertise, they're going to hit two different, very, very different people. So who's your target market? Who's your list? Who are you going after? Um, and once you've established that, there are probably a lot of people going after that same target market. So what are your three uniques? What are the things that make your business unique as you've identified this as your market? It, it doesn't, listen, it, competition's healthy. When, you know, for our coffee clients, we actually look for, in, for our coffee clients as they're looking for new, new locations to open, we'll say, hey, where's, where's Starbucks at? And we'll actually encourage them, open up someplace right across the corner, right, right down the street, because Starbucks has done all the market research to determine the best corner in town. And your niche is different. Your uniques are different. Maybe your, your list, your target market are coffee drinkers, but your uniques are different. Usually we're working with indie coffee shops. Well, an indie coffee shop, coffee consumer is oftentimes a lot different than a Starbucks coffee consumer. So if you can determine what the best corner is to get all the traffic, your unique is gonna separate out your list and you're gonna be able to peel off who your people are, but you need to get clear on what are you, your, your unique things in business. And then what's your proven process? Like, how are you gonna to sell to these people that this is what you do and how it's different. And I'd say it should speak to your three uniques. What's your proven profit, promise or process? And then what's your guarantee? I think it's good to have a guarantee. All those things are gonna build your offer, you know, because this is where it starts. Who are we marketing to? This is what sets us apart. This is our proven process that gets people there. And this is what we can guarantee would be the result. From there, you then have a marketing vehicle that's able to take you forward, which leads us on into a three-year picture. So you started with a 10-year target. Your three-year picture is at this future date, three years from now, this is what I would like to see in sales. This is what I'd like my profitability percentage to be. These are the measurables I'm going to use to determine if I'm successful. And then I'm going to actually visualize that out. You know, Hal Elrod in his book, uh, Miracle Morning, which I would highly advocate for if you've never read it, it's just great for your own personal ethos, your own personal rhythms in the morning. I really love it a lot. It's not a spiritual book, even though it sounds like that a little bit, but it's just good for setting up your, your framework. Um, he has this whole section in there that's called visualization. If you were able to write the book, what does it look like in three years? Where would you like to be? Visualize it, see yourself there, ask yourself, okay, if that's where I want to be, what's it going to take me to get there? And then that's where it leads down to um, in the next section. And that is, therefore, we've talked about the 10-year target, the three-year picture. How does that work out this year?
What's our one-year plan? Like, how does, how does my visualization of this, how do I get there in three years? Well, it's how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time? It's going to take me incremental steps to get to that three-year picture, to get to that 10-year target. So how am I tackling that this year? Um, so at a future date, one year from now, these are my revenue sales goal numbers and my stretch goal. It's good to have a stretch, right? Like I would say you're, you're in, with coffee clients as well. We do a sales and a reach tool for them of, Hey, this is where you were last year. L Y where do you want to be this year? We'll usually increase that just a little bit. And then what's your reach a little bit more. And that way you can celebrate with people as you hit your sales goal and your reach goal accordingly. And the great thing about a reach goal is usually you've created probably a little bit more profit and you can maybe do some cool bonus stuff, some cool reward stuff, some cool things around it. If everybody knows what the mission is, everybody can push towards hitting that reach goal. So I think it's a good thing to, to establish. Profitability, um, super important, kind of differs between different industries. You know, in a coffee industry, it might be eight to 12%. Maybe, maybe if you're really lucky, you can stretch that up to maybe 18% profitability. Um, but, you know, there's some months that you're lower than that. Um, online entrepreneur space, you can easily live within 30 to 40% profitability range because you don't have as many hard costs. You know, you don't have a, a building you're operating out of necessarily. If you have all virtual people, they're all working from home, you know, so your cost, your COGS, your cost of goods is a lot of times a lot lower. So your profitability can be higher. So just determining what's the profitability percentage you're shooting for. And then what are the measurables? How are we going to measure success? Like, what are the things that we want to see? For us this year, it was, you know, we've moved pretty hard into subscription model. Like we're trying to sell people into Ops Experts Club, Coffee Experts Club, you know, products with Gap Analyzer, you know. So for us, some of the measurables are going to be, we want this much percent of our gross revenue to be in subscription. We want this percentage of gross revenue to be in product sales. And then this much to be in service. Up to this point, for a lot of years, Collab Team was all services. So, you know, we're trying to break out our, our metrics a little bit and talk about how we can get there percentage-wise. And then what are the goals for the year? Um, the goals for the year are then going to affect what your rocks are for the quarter, right? Because as we say, these are our five big things. Well, quarterly then, where do we want to be by the end of quarter one? So do you guys see how that's going to be? So quarter rocks speak back to annual plan, speaks back to three-year picture, speaks back to your 10-year target, and each one you're escalating up. Now, you may think, Aaron, man, that's a lot of planning. Like, how do I get there? That really is where the issues list kicks off. And that's where you start talking through what are the issues we're facing. And if any of you do L10s, you're used to this, uh, this Google Sheet. But it's essentially, let's start writing out the, the issues that we see with us working towards this direction. And then let's list them out here. And let's begin to tackle those and turn those into weekly deliverables that people can begin to chisel down, chisel down, chisel down, chisel down. Chisel down. Like, let's tie it off. I don't want to keep hearing about that. So how can I tie that off and get rid of that? And if that can't be done in a week's time, let's make it a quarter rock so that we can get that done by the end of this quarter. But I don't want to be looking at that thing two quarters from now. How can we get that obstacle out of the way? So that's kind of a, a snapshot of this tool, the VTO how it plays into issues, how it ties back into weekly meetings. Um, Taryn, Savannah, you guys have any, any comments or we, we can open this up and just kind of can round Robin about some of these things. If you have questions about this tool or, and then we can move to Slido towards the end. Um, I would just add that kind of like everything else that we've talked about here, like looking at it in this overview, it can look like a lot and look intimidating. And I mean, it is a lot, like you're tackling some really big things for your company in it. But once you start diving into it, 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 it feels more natural once you start kind of working through it. Um, and then especially if you start kind of like with your issue section, so you know some some kind of key problems that you're facing, it kind of will speak to the other things that you're trying to work through. Um, so, so just like I've said about pretty much every other thing we've talked about on these meetings is don't be intimidated, just like, you know, jump in. And once you start going through it, it'll it'll make sense and, and you'll be able to kind of get it without, without feeling too overwhelmed. That's good, Savannah, thank you. Taryn, what are your thoughts? I personally love the vision mission, getting to review that as well as the VTO. And the way this works downstream is as you decide this um, on a leadership team level, all those leaders then go down to their personal L10s with their with their groups and share this with them the following week. So then everybody that's a whole part of the company 
is getting to view on a regular basis the vision, the mission, the core focus, what the whole company goal is. So people don't end up working in silos. They actually get to feel like, okay, we're, we all know what the big picture is and we're constantly getting to review it and uh, get reminded of it. So it, it gets people out of those silos. I know I've worked in places where I had no idea what the mission of the company was. What is the mission statement? What are we doing? I know what my job is, but what's our end goal? Uh, so I really enjoy that piece of it. Yeah, I think um, that's a good point, Jaren. There's there's a book out there that's called Five Dysfunctions of a Team, um, and, and it's called A Leadership Fable, but it's by uh, Lycioni, I think. Yeah, Patrick Lycioni. Um, amazing book, you know, because it's told like a kid's story, but it talks a lot about silos. You know, and it talks about like, so the tech department over here, because, you know, maybe you're just building your business, you know, Daryl's just starting to set up departments within his business and different people that own different things and people are hand, helping him with his marketing, people are helping him with his ops and his finance and like, as setting it up, you know, you're working with all the same people, right? So it seems silly to break it up too far. But as you get into like more and more people added in, like where Kimberly's at, you're starting to form teams. And so it's great if you're doing L10s at the top, but if L10s don't shake down the way that you're doing your meeting style at the top doesn't shake down into each one of those areas of business, then you can really start forming into silos where it's like, and tech is the, one of the most like nasty villains of them all with that. A lot of times is if tech just starts siloing off and they don't hear the rest of the, the language of the business, you can really just feel like I'm just working with stuff. I'm just working with the technical side of things. I don't need to know all that stuff. I don't need to know the sales stuff. I don't need to know the marketing stuff. I don't need to know the customer experience. This is what's best. But like Savannah can tell you very firsthand like if tech doesn't understand what customer service is feeling, like tech can throw so much dust into customer experience that customer experience is dealing with hundreds of tickets now trying to work through pain points that could have just been solved if customer experience was talking to tech, you know, and silos can be really painful. And the vice versa. Of a team is really, really good. Yeah. Tell us, tell us, Savannah. I was going to say, and vice versa, if, if, uh, if the, your customer experience team is like making a bunch of decisions and kind of deciding things on customer journey, but then they're not communicating that to tech, then tech doesn't know. And so then people might throw tech under the bus, like, Hey, like this isn't working to make our customers happy when really it's like, okay, well, like tech didn't know. So it's not like, it's not like one facet of your team is trying to mess up another facet of your team. Everyone wants everyone to do well, right. but if you're not talking to each other, then yeah, you're going to end up accidentally throwing each other under the bus. And then it's going to create more conflicts within your team as well as, you know, with your customers outside of your team. I love that. Yeah. I think silos and getting away from, yeah, you're right, Savannah. So five dysfunctions of a team. And it was, uh, what did I say? This Licioni, um, Patrick Lencioni is is the author but great great one great simple read if you're looking for a good book club thing to do with your with your team it's a great one place to start um any other thoughts any other comments um i feel like uh kimberly you're you're neck deep in the build out do you have any thoughts on framework and operating from a plan dude um yeah <laughs> a lot of them um that's where it's at. There's just, there's not any other way for like sustainable sustainability over time. Like you can come in and kind of like, okay, it's like organizing your toddler's room, but not having a process of keeping it that way. You've just wasted your Saturday. And it's kind of the same thing. Like you can, you can come in and think you've done a great job in something, but if you don't have a, a process that shakes down to like all the people, then it's, it, it was for not, you know, like that's, Phase, phase uh, one doesn't happen without phase two. And so, and that's something like you talked about silos. That's something that we're um, currently like with the marketing team coming into an L10. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, I'm so excited about that because that was a huge silo. It was like the marketing team, we've got a third party person and he's kind of calling the shots. I'm like, we don't know what y'all are doing. And yet we're catching all the feels like all the pain points and all these things that are like 95% avoidable. And I'm like, come on guys, do you love us? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> get, getting everybody on L 10s is, is going to be, it's going to be awesome. I think it's gonna be a little painful at first, but then once we get it rocking and rolling, um, it's really going to help us do exactly what Taryn was talking about, like making sure that this 
is filtered throughout the team so that we're all on the same page. We're all working from the same ethos and we all have the same goal in mind that is something we, we're aware of and we've agreed upon beforehand. So um, yeah, yeah, good stuff, guys. And good and like good kudos to Kimberly. Like Kimberly did really good this last L10 of like suggesting it and then like holding her ground on it for that whole marketing L10 thing. Like that was, that came out of Kimberly's brain and you could tell it hit the visionary a little bit like, oh, wait actually yeah like and it was like good like content and good holding the line and good holding infrastructure as as an integrator within your team so well done on that Kimberly thank you a lot of pre-prayer went into that one yeah, you did great you did awesome